assigned a pleasant task of introducing Dr. Srinivas Kaiti. Dr. Srinivas Kaiti uh, is currently working as a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Deputy Controller of Examination at NMIT Nipte. He obtained his PE in Industrial Production Engineering from NMIT in 1993 and MTech in Maintenance Engineering from SJC in Mysore in 1996. He obtained his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Mysore University in 2004. He has 22 years of teaching and research experience. He has 159 papers in various international and national journals and conferences. He went to Uttar State University, Uttar USA as a postdoctoral research, uh, research scholar in metal machining for a period of one year. He is a life member of Indian Society for Technical Education, associate member of the Institute of Engineers, life member of Psychology India Society of India, and life member of Condition Monitoring Society of India. He has won the following awards. Indian Society for Technical Education, ISD, STSITS National Award for Research Work Done by Young Teachers, below 25 of Engineering Colleges for the year 2005, and Air India Board Award for District of Uruguay for the year 2006. He has conducted several national level conferences and workshops with funding from AICT, New Delhi, KPO, and ISD. He completed many sponsored research projects and uh, he has successfully guided four PhD scholars. With this brief introduction, I present before you Dr. Srinivas Rai. Because 
you know very well that, or for that matter in India, I can make this statement very boldly. In India, <coughs> the awareness that teaching, for that matter, whether it is engineering or any other discipline, people think it's just an art, <coughs> but it's a science. But why is it science? Because there is a lot of research behind it. And if you look in the Indian context, the number of papers available, the number of people working in this area are very minimal, very limited. Because we have still not taken this particular area very seriously. Of course, there have been efforts going on and one of the pioneering organizations which has been helping in doing this is nothing but the Indian Society for Technical Education which is sponsoring our uh, uh, FIP. So Indian Society for Technical Education is one of the leading uh, societies, technical societies in India where all teachers are supposed to become members. So the, one of the prior requirements for become, becoming a participant from this workshop is you have to be an IST member. If not, they have to encourage you. That's what they have mentioned in the proposal that if somebody is not a member, please encourage them to become the members of Indian Society for Technical Education. So that is one organization which is working in this particular area by organizing these kinds of workshops, seminars, FIPs, faculty induction programs. But that is not on a very limited scale. <coughs> then we have the National Institutes of Technical Teachers Training and Research. Earlier they were called as TPTIs, Technical Teachers Training Institutes. And later on they become NIPTPRs, you know that. And they are all under Ministry of Human Resource Development. And they have the same status as IIDs and IIMs enjoy in India. They are all premier organizations which are working in the area of engineering education research. And we are, we are very lucky to have a very uh, senior professor who is a director of NIPTPR Chennai who will be inaugurating this FDP, sorry, FIP as well as giving the keynote lecture and there is one resource person, a very senior professor, civil engineering professor, PSM Suresh, who is also an expert in MBA peaks. So he will be conducting sessions in the afternoon. And tomorrow we have Dr. Janar Bharat, again another expert from NIPPR, who will be conducting the sessions. Followed by this, there are certain IITs which are also working in this area. And one of the IITs which, are, which is again doing pioneering work in this area is IIT Kharagpur. And we have a faculty from IIT, Kharagpur, Dr. Shamal Kumar Das Pandal, who will be virtually handling about six sessions, if you have seen the schedule. And uh, there is a something called as Center for Education and Technology in IIT Kharagpur. And they conduct these kinds of programs. <coughs> Actually, when I contacted him, he said, sir, generally we do it for three days or two days. And virtually I had to request him to just bring it down and uh, make him agree to do only for one and a half days. So they go outside and conduct these kinds of sessions. So other than that, there are very limited efforts going on. And you know very well that we are going into outcome-based education. That is a buzzword these days. Why? Because India has become a permanent secretary of the Washington Accord, very recently in 2014. That means whatever degree is awarded in India, that will be equivalent to any degree awarded in any foreign countries. Okay? Otherwise, earlier that there was an issue. That means a degree awarded in India, maybe a Bachelor of Engineering degree, it was not considered equivalent to a Bachelor of Engineering or Bachelor of Science degree awarded in US or UK. But now because of this signing of the Washington Accord, this has become possible. And we have to now go for outcome-based education. Even the accreditation process that we are now going to is also outcome-based education. And we NNMIT, we are an entire run institution, you know, because we are an autonomous institution. And we have already completed one cycle, and a few of our departments, including mechanical, we have been accredited for three years. We recently got our results. So, outcome based education is going to be the order of the day from now on. Okay? And this workshop basically tries to give you an overview about things about outcome based education by various experts. Now, there could be some kind of an overlap, you have to excuse us for that because the topics covered by different speakers may overlap, but each author or each expert will give his perspective so that you can understand things better. So that is our whole objective. And there are certain other things, there are certain changes that have happened uh, uh, in the way these FIPs are con uh, conducted in uh, IST. I will make a mention of it when uh, we have the normal function because still the seats are vacant, we are expecting the people to come. 
But by the end of the session, I will give you an assignment which has to be done seriously and it has to be submitted on the last day of the FI, which will be considered for evaluation. Because there is an evaluation procedure which we are supposed to follow as per the instructions of ISTE. So I will tell you what that assignment is when I finish this particular session. Now, coming to the motivation for this particular workshop, about two years back in 2016, we, myself and Dr. K. Subramanyavat, we, Dr. Subramanyavat also happens to be the director of IQAC. IQAC is Internal Quality Assurance Cell, which is very much essential for the charity, KICP, ISP. And uh, these days we have MPTL courses available. Many of you might have yourself undergone MPTL courses on your. In fact, we have a very active MPTL uh, center in Nikte, where many of our faculty and students register for MPTL courses and they pass those courses. MOOCs, you are aware of, uh, aware of MOOCs. So most of them voluntarily do a lot of. I myself have undergone three MOOCs offered by IUC India, Universal Collaboration for Engineering Education, but probably it requires a little effort and I don't have the time to because you have to write assignments, you have to write tests, and you should uh, coordinate your timings with the timing at which they give you the seminar online. Of course, you can even look at it offline. Because if you have access to the uh, portal, you can go offline, you can access the lecture videos and see what they have taught. But it requires some concerted effort. <coughs> so, another very worrying factor which Dr. Subhavadeva shared with me very recently, and I also went through the statistics, you might be knowing that the craze for engineering in India has drastically dropped. I hope you are all aware. 2015, 16, 16, 17, 50% of the seats. Engineering seats all over India are vacant. People are not people are not taking engineering seats anymore because engineering is no more a craze in India. That's a very very interesting uh, uh, fact that I came across very recently. In Gujarat, Gujarat has already finished its uh, CET and all that. And it, it, after past one round of counselling, still more than 60% of the seats are vacant. And private colleges are willing to give seats for 2,500 rupees as low fees. 2,500 fees, free laptops. Concession in hostel fees. So, so many kinds of uh, allurements are being given to the parents and students to make them join technical education. So, we are we are going to, I mean, things are going to be more difficult in the days to come. You might also have heard that more than 200, 300 engineering colleges have closed down in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu. So, things are not going to be very rosy from now on. Things are going to be more difficult. So, that also has to be factored in now. Okay other than teaching engineering, these issues also have to be factored in. So if you don't take all these issues into account, your survival becomes very difficult. Yeah. So survival, now it is a question of survival for engineering teachers. I hope many, see in Nitte we have this performance appraisal. If there are any MIT faculty, can I see any MIT faculty? So MIT faculty know the kind of stress and strain they have with regard to their performance appraisal every year. So they have to meet certain targets to get some incentives and so on. So there is a lot of pressure on teachers. So if you don't perform, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. So that is another negative aspect that we are coming across in regard to engineering education. Okay. In looking at some information from various standard bodies, back in 1991 itself, the American Society for Engineering Education made some recommendations in regard to what engineering should be all about. Long back, and most of these are now factored into your program outcomes. The program outcomes that we have from AICP, sorry, yeah, AICP, NDA. So, what is the significance of engineering? So, again, I did not have to tell you all these things, but there are certain very interesting statements that I got from literature. So, I will read this one. The global economic reality is one where a sports car which is financed in Japan, yet it could be designed in Italy, assembled in Indiana, Mexico and France, will then use advanced electronic components invented in New Jersey and will finally actually be constructed back in Japan. So there will be no more national products and technologies, no national corporations, no national industries, there will no longer be national economies, all that will remain rooted within national borders and the people who comprise the nation. So, ultimately what is going to be the future? It's only the skills of the individual. Yeah. So, we don't have organizations, we don't have industries, nothing is there. We are, we, are going to, we are going into a borderless world where only the individual skills, knowledge, 
with what matters. So, role of engineers may be very well. They have a vital role in the prosperity of a nation. And it is our duty as teachers to make their learning more effective for engineering students. So, we will be looking into these various learning aspects when we look into Bloom's taxonomy and all that. You know, there are different kinds of domains in which we offer knowledge to students, psychomotor domain, or effective or cognitive domain. So, you have to do your teaching in such a way that you are able to cover these various domains. Okay? So, the usual notion is what is teaching? Teaching means I simply come to the classroom with a ready made notes or textbook. And then I will simply write everything on the board or I dictate some notes and then that's the end of it. So that's a conventional notion we have about teaching. But those things are not going to work anymore. Okay? Because you know the dynamism of the students. Class is very dynamic. Okay? Students are very difficult to handle. The students' mentalities are difficult. And the students are very smart these days. And the most important thing, their attention span is very limited. If I go on, even for your, in your case also, if I go on giving you lectures, for example, you will start feeling sleepy because it's very difficult to catch hold of the attention of an individual. Other than if I have various other modes by which I can attract your attention, it's very difficult. For 10, 10 15 minutes, they can concentrate. After that, they will no more be interested. So, there is a need for teachers to adopt better and better pedagogical techniques which can help them to make the class more interesting. So you make the class more interesting and also at the same time provide them with necessary information because you have students from different calibers. Okay, you have students which are at the lowest level who are not at all interested to students which are who are at the highest level where they are highly motivated. So I have to cater to both their needs. It's very difficult. If I start solving all simple basic problems, the person who is at the highest level gets bored. What is this? He is only giving all the fundamentals. But if I start solving very complex problems, the student at the highest level is fully excited and motivated, but the student at the lowest level doesn't understand anything. So these are the kinds of issues that you are going to come across when you do your teaching. Okay, so some more very interesting information. So Krishna Vedula, he is the emeritus professor from US who is the coordinator of this IUC. You can go to Google and put Indo Universal Collaboration on Engineering Education, you will get a lot of information. They can have a lot of training programs for teachers. You yourself can become a participant. Nominal fee they charge. And you can go through that course. It's online, in the online mode. So he is a emeritus professor from US. So he, with a group of people, they, are, they have started this initiative for the last 5-6 years. And a lot of things they have made. Very recently they conducted an international conference in collaboration with the Andhra Pradesh Skill Development Corporation in uh, Hyderabad, not Hyderabad, in Vishakhapatnam, in Vishakhapatnam, this month, July, last week they conducted, or I think this week, I'm not very really sure, they are going to have an international conference. So, they have published a paper in the JEEP, that is General of Human Education Transformations in 2017, and these are the barriers for adopting educational innovations by teachers. And this adapt this is applicable for us also. Okay. Individual adapter means you, individual faculty, individual teachers. That is the system. Okay. And then innovation. So lack of interest, teachers are not interested. Skepticism of innovations, effectiveness. So you are not very sure whether the student will accept your innovation. We have a faculty sitting here, he will show you a small innovation that he has brought into the teaching process, which is called project based learning. He teaches a subject called kinematics of machines. Where you know there are mechanisms, if mechanical engineers are there, they will know what are mechanisms. Mechanisms are very difficult to understand. And he has made the students to develop models of these mechanisms. And those models have been made by students in group as a small project work. And they have been able to understand the concepts much more easier than simply looking at a drawing which is not on the board. Or maybe looking at some videos. So, if you should be self-motivated, there will not be any support for you. Now I am doing a workshop here on FIB or FIB on teaching engineering. Probably if I had spoken this to somebody, maybe the higher ups, they might not have motivated me much because they don't know the significance of it or maybe they don't know whether we will get proper response. But I have to proceed because I am very interested in this and deeply committed to this particular 
hole for this particular area. So that's why I thought whatever may be the matter. Anyway, if I do it in-house, maybe there will be issues of funding, I will do it by external funding. So there are no issues of funding. I will get necessary funding from outside and I can very effectively organize this. So there is a skepticism of innovations, effectiveness, lack of confidence. And then of course, time and effort, common complaint. We have only one hour, we have 39 hours per elective, we have 52 hours for a core subject. How will we bring in all these innovations? You have to look at the videos of experts. I will show you the names of some experts. Just go to their website and see how effectively they tell you that you can bring in innovation with no much effort. He says, he or she says, just spend 10 minutes of your time. That's enough. You will not have to spend half an hour for bringing in that innovation. 10 minutes, bring in that innovation. You can bring in a lot of changes. Not my statement. Statement made by experts. System. Probably you may think, why should I do it? I am not going to get any benefit out of it. No incentive. Require structure. So we need an ecosystem which will support your efforts like this. Okay. So of course we have a very friendly management who helps us or supports us in this kind of initiative. So we have a lot of small initiatives which we have been doing in the mechanical department, which we will share with you over the week. So you need to have a supportive ecosystem which will help you to carry out your initiatives. And then of course, if you are going into those innovations, you need to know what is the background for that, what is the work, similar kind of work has it already been done, what are the results that are available. So these are some of the barriers that you have when you are going to incorporate educational innovations. Now why do we need to change engineering education? So three main reasons, changing needs of employers, employers needs keep on changing, but for that matter you can go on keeping changing your curriculum, a very interesting observation was made by a governing council member who came to our college, a very senior professor, former vice chancellor, he said, there is no point in changing your curriculum for the industry, okay. You are here to teach fundamentals, you just do that. Industry says, somebody says we want uh, specialization in one field, I start offering courses on that. Some other industry says I want specialization in this course, I should. It doesn't make any sense. Engineering education is basically to provide fundamentals to the students. And you should do it. You just do that. If they are interested, they are motivated, they will learn on their own. Any additional learning is required, they will do it on your own. You cannot have a curriculum wherein you can incorporate all the suggestions given by various industries highly impossible and you should never attempt to do it also. Okay? Changing needs of employers, changing needs of students, wider economic and political changes. So these are the two stalwarts who are world leaders in engineering education research. You can go to their websites and see. His name is Richard Feider. He is the first Salamis Professor Emeritus of chemical engineering at the North Carolina State University. This is his uh, web ID. You just have to log in here. You will have hundreds of papers which he has written over the last 30 years. He has been in this, he's been working in this field for the last 30 years. So very simple concepts. Okay, he is not talking any hi-fi concepts, very simple concepts. In the morning, just before I came to this session on the bus, I was getting a paper on mentoring. How do we mentor before I proceed further? I will quickly share with you that information. If a junior faculty enters into the department with an untech, okay, and he doesn't know anything about teaching, and he, but as usual in Indian context, you are expected to start teaching on the first day. You have to take a job and go, go to the class and start doing derivations and teach. That's a common Indian perception we have. But what do they do in North Carolina State University? They have a scheme called mentor mentee scheme. Mentor mentee. Okay. For example, this professor becomes a mentor in this department and the newly joined faculty becomes a mentee. They both will together design a course. Design a course means they will offer a course. The course will all, already be ready, the course content is considerable, everything will be ready. They will be teaching the course jointly. You understand? Jointly means the whole syllabus will be covered jointly by this professor and the newly joined faculty. And what is the speciality? The mentor will sit in mentee's class, the mentee will sit in mentor's class. Both. You both have to sit in each other's class. And they should not make any comments when the classes are going on. They should not make any comments when the classes are going on. They should simply observe how the class is conducted 
and they have to make observations. Okay. Even if the situation is very serious, imagine some students are troubling this newly joined faculty, they are making fun of him because he doesn't know how to teach, he is staggering, he is feeling nervous, he is stuck somewhere in a calculation, derivation he is not able to complete. Whatever may be the situation, the mentor will not interfere, will not help him or her, he will only observe and make all the observations. And then they will sit together in what is called as a debriefing session where they will share the information. That means the mentor will give his opinion about the mentee, the mentee will give his opinion about the mentee. And they will do it like this for the entire semester and this has been a very successful program which is still going on in the North Carolina State University. It's called Mentor Mentee Program. And I also feel, what do you feel? I think that is the most effective way because we have a very senior professor in your department let's say who has about 25 years of experience with a PhD and all that and if he can mentor you, that's the best part of it. You need not have to go to any uh, teaching uh, training programs because he himself, his experience himself is enough for you to learn about the things. Because you know very well that classroom is a very dynamic uh, scenario, right? You might, you yourself might have experienced. I will have a class today who is very quiet, very studious, they, will, they are so uh, interested, they will do everything and after another two days I go, even if it is a first hour at 9 o'clock, they are totally distracted, they are not interested, they are making all kinds of nuisances in the class. So the dynamics keep changing and we, do, we cannot predict what are the factors which are affecting the dynamics of the students inside the class, it is changing. So that's why this kind of initiative according to me is definitely going to help. So this is Richard Felder. And this is Philip C. Wong, that is a Delta Nellora Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering at Purdue University. And he has written a book called Teaching Engineering, which is again available for free in the net. And the entire course material that I have prepared is mainly based on that textbook, Teaching Engineering by Philip C. Wong. So, see, uh, we, we have not given you the course material, we will give you later because we have to do the Xerox. <coughs> I have included some interesting papers for your reference. Okay, some interesting papers I have included in the course material. Not a soft copy, hard copy has been put in the book which you can directly read. And since it was his paper, I had to seek his permission. Copyright issues are there. I cannot simply see as responsible teachers in engineering, we should know that there is something called as copyright issues. I cannot simply download somebody's paper and take print out and start distributing to people. It's not possible. So I just wrote the mail to him and see how nicely he has written the reply for the mail that I have written. So he is very much willing to allow me to share his resources. So you are you are free to use my resources. Please use my resources if it is for the betterment of the technical education. So this is a response that I got from Richard and Felder before I included his papers into the course material that we are going to distribute to you shortly. I have also included a very interesting 50-page uh, textbook. Again, it will be there in your course material. A very interesting book which will tell you how to write course outcomes. The most difficult part in the outcome-based education, even we still we struggle to write course outcomes. Okay? Because there is a technique behind it. We don't know the science behind it. Somebody tells us something to do and we simply copy it without knowing the background of it. There is a 54-page book available which is published by University Park College, Ireland. So again, I had written to this lady to seek her permission and she said, you may print off the PDF and make copies for the purpose of dissemination to faculty members, provided you don't charge anything for it. So if you are not using it for commercial purposes, you are more than welcome to use this material. Similarly, this is the professor who wrote a book. So writing and using learning outcomes of practical life, that's the name of the book. So he also has given his permission to get the book printed, it's from University College or Ireland. So, to give you some more information about the initiatives that have been taking place all over the world, as far as engineering education research is concerned, these are some examples. As I said, most of the efforts are happening in US. Most of the efforts are happening in US. So these are some of the universities where we have these kind of uh, institutes which are helping in teaching engineering to the faculty, not only to the faculty, to the PhD scholars, to the postdoc scholars, everybody can become uh, students of this particular course. Okay, now let's go a little deeper into the topic. What is the general complaint among engineering lecturers? Students simply fail to learn much of the material presented to them. 
They pass exams quite common, even though they demonstrate misconceptions about fundamental concepts. So quite naturally, you know, quite common way of learning things is what? Simply memorizing and then putting it in a paper, passing the exam and that's the end of it. Okay. Then getting into a job is of course your individual skills and talent, that plays a matter, yeah. that plays a role. So increasing knowledge, memorizing and reproducing, acquiring facts and skills that can be applied, understanding and interpreting reality in a new way. So this is what is required. Memorizing is still a necessity. Memorizing is still a necessity. Well, because you, if you look at the Bloom's taxonomy, what do you have at the lowest level? L1, L1 is nothing but memorizing. I have to remember things. If I am standing here and saying so many things to you, if my memory is not active, then it's a waste. And how will my memory be active? I have to keep reading. I have to read, read this information several times so that I can recall facts when I am speaking to you. So, memory is still important, but other than memory, there are various other aspects which we need to look into. Now, according to Peter J. Goodhue, he is also a very good professor who has written again a textbook on engineering education. There are at least four motives for providing education in engineering. So, these are the four motives. Prepare students for research. Prepare graduates for employment in engineering industry. Prepare engineering science, numerically iterate citizens for the society, and of course, provide an intellectually stimulated education. So finally, whatever education we provide, it should stimulate all classes of students. That's very important. It should stimulate all classes of students. It's not that I'm only catering to the need of the dull students. It's not that I'm only catering to the needs of high caliber students. I need to meet the requirements of all classes of students. So as I said, this particular point is very important which I want to drive home through my presentation that teaching is not only an art, it's a science. Science because there is a science behind it. Okay? And we should know as teachers that what is that science and it's for me to understand it. And if I am able to understand it, can I implement it in whatever little way in the teaching that I do in my class. Now, Maggie Chi and Sweeney Key, again, they are, they are again uh, leaders, they, are, they, are, they also have written a very good textbook. All these books are available in the net for free. Okay. You have to just key in the author name and you can download the textbooks. Okay. We have not done that, but for your information, you can. They have uh, written textbooks about teaching, but not with respect to engineering. Effective teaching demands more than acquisition of skills. The teacher needs to understand the educational needs of a particular class, find it at a particular time, time is very important. And as I said, whatever is relevant today is not relevant tomorrow because it's a dynamic class. That's what I said. One day they are fully interested, very studious, whatever homework I give they will do without any problems. And another day I go, they are totally disintegrated, they are not interested, they are hyperactive, they are creating nuisance inside the class. How do I judge the same students? In one day they are in a particular way, on another day they are behaving in a totally different way. So that's why at a particular time. So this is very important. And adapt and try to understand the underlying theory of learning and teaching so that each teacher can develop his or her own methods. So mind it, every teacher has to develop his or her own method. There is no universal method available in teaching. Okay. What works for you may not work for me. What works for me may not work for you. Maybe probably some of you may not agree or you may not be liking the way I am teaching now. I have already finished 30 minutes of my class, right? Some of you may like, some of you may not like. But I cannot help, that's how I am. Okay. But what is important is, I have at least reached whoever is sitting here, correct? Or at least 10% of the information that I have shared with you has gone into you. That's enough. 10 to 20% whatever I do in a particular session. If that has been recorded in your brain and you have heard something, you have written something, that is more than enough for you. Okay. So there is no universal method of teaching. Everybody has to develop their own method. Skills in teaching is not simply to be learned and repeated as there is always room to go. As a teacher reflects about these are classes, new insights are obtained and they can develop their own theory of learning and teaching. So today teaching has been recognized as an area of scholarship. So that is the kind of significance we have for teaching today. Teaching is a scholarship itself. Okay. That means somebody, anybody cannot come and say, I am going to teach. It's not going to work. Okay. If you try to do it, you will be a bad teacher, that's all. If you want to be a good teacher, you should know the scholarship behind it. So, what are the general issues that, are, that we face as teachers? 
So, the problems facing engineer education have changed. The scenario has changed. Student population demographics also has changed. You get students from different states, from different cultures. So, how do I assimilate them inside the class? Okay. Some are tech savvy, some are not digitally smart students, some are rich, some are poor, economic, social conditions, rapid obsolescence of technology, and the most important is focus on the learner. You have to focus on the learner. The focus is not on the teacher, the focus is on the learner. So whatever I stand here and say, that is not important. What you have learned at the end of six days, that is more important. Okay. And if that has happened, the whole purpose of organizing this FIP has been fulfilled up otherwise it's a failure. Yeah. Ultimately, the learner is more important than the teacher who is standing and giving lectures about the particular course or topic. According to EPEC, engineers shall perform services in only those areas where they have competence. So you are supposed to provide services in only those areas where you have competence. Each student is a trained to work in a particular way as a mechanical engineer, as an electrical engineer, as an electronics engineer. So based on your competency, you have to provide necessary services. Now let's try to get into the theoretical aspects of teaching, some models, some theories. Logan in 1985 said there are two dimensions for good teaching, or he developed what is called as a two-dimensional model of good teaching. What is the first dimension? The first dimension is intellectual excitement of the teacher. Am I intellectually excited now when I am speaking before you? What do you feel? So, with some motivation I am doing it today because it is the first day, first session. Maybe my excitement level is a little higher but later on may, it may reduce. Yeah, but the first dimension is intellectual excitement. What does it contain? Content and performance. Content means what content I am presenting before you. Performance is what I am doing now. Moving this side to that side, trying to focus on each of the participant who is sitting here, trying to understand what he is understanding. Is he looking at me? Is he sleeping? Is he looking at the mobile? All those things I should be able to do when I am handling the class. Okay? So, content and performance. So, I can have three levels. High, extremely clear and exciting. Medium, clear and interesting. Low. Play and tell. Okay. The perfect intellectual excitement is not very strong. It's big. Second dimension is interpersonal rapport. What is the obligation of the teachers to the students? What is the obligation? Again, here, here I can have three levels. It can be very high. That means the teacher is warm, open, predictable. As a student, we might have experiences where our teachers are highly unpredictable. And what, what, what instant they get angry, we don't know. Okay. So you, that is not an acceptable behavior for a teacher. Totally unpredictable behavior. He is quiet for some time and suddenly he loses his temper and starts shouting at a particular student. It's an unpredictable behavior, which is not acceptable. Okay. I was like that a few years back. Okay. This is all a learning experience over the years. Maybe 10 years back or 15 years back, I was an ordinary teacher, only trying to teach trying to establish that you are a good teacher, maybe trying to sometimes overpower the students, getting angry with students, all those things were there. But over the years, as people mature, understand, all these things become second. Okay. So, warm, open, predictable, highly student-oriented. So, one common example that I come across is some teachers, when they call the names of the students, they call numbers, which is highly insulting. Correct? I want to call the names of the students who are there inside the class at the end of my class. I, I have seen some teachers calling one, two, three, four. What is this? They are all human beings. They have good names. You have to call their names. That is one of the ways in which you can build in rapport with the students. Calling their names, at least if not full name, first name, that itself is enough. Some rapport I am building. I am simply calling them numbers. What will he think about me as a teacher? Because he simply considered me as role numbers and nothing else. Okay. So, I should be student oriented. Medium, relatively warm, approachable, democratic, and predictable. Low, cold distance, highly controlling, unpredictable. And very low, always punishing, sarcastic, attacking, disdainful, and so on. So, these are the two dimensional model of teaching proposed by. What is the name of the professor? 
describe the learning process that happens in the students. First there is behaviorism. This is not only true for teaching, this is true in general life also. Okay. It is based on the central theme that a reaction is being made to a particular stimulus. Or in other words, it's based on stimulus response relationship. I conduct the class, I provide a particular stimulus to the student remotely by asking him some question, and then I get a particular response from the student. Okay. It, could be, it could be about the knowledge that I have imparted to him. It could be what are the doubts that he has. So it is based on the stimulus response relationship. So according to this theory, what is learning? Learning is simply defined as acquisition of new behavior. You are only acquiring a new behavior in a particular scenario. It gives little importance to mental activity. Concept formation or understanding. So in this theory, you are not giving much importance to the mental activity that happens in the mind. You are not giving importance to the formation of concept in the mind. When I teach something, I should be able to generate some concept in the mind of the student about that topic that I am teaching. That's called as concept generation. And when it improves his understanding. Probably this helps in training, behaviorism, this particular theory helps in training for skill development. But if you go to constructivism, this is the second learning theory. It comes under the broad heading of cognitive science, wherein there is cognitive involvement in learning. And when does learning take place? You already have some knowledge, and now I am imparting you some knowledge, and that knowledge gets added to the existing knowledge, and it brings about some transformation in the existing knowledge. So that is what is called as the constructivism theory of learning. So new information is built into and added into the individual's current knowledge, understanding and skills. That's what we do. So all the students that come into engineering, they all have necessary background of mathematics, physics and chemistry. And what is that we have to do? We are simply adding additional information to the information that they already have. But we don't know that. I teach a course called mechanical vibrations. Okay. When I ask some fundamental questions on mechanical vibrations, they don't answer in the first class. But the funniest part is, my son who is studying in 9th standard, under CBSE syllabus, the same concepts are being taught there. What is vibration? It is relative motion, that's all. Okay. The motion which repeats itself at regular intervals of time is vibrations. All the fundamental concepts that I teach in vibrations has already been covered in 8th or 9th standard in the CBSE syllabus with all beautiful diagrams and everything. And now when I am coming to see his career, this course is taught in the 7th semester, mind it, 7th semester of engineering in our college. And when I come to the first class and ask him what is vibrations, nobody is able to answer the question. What is the simplest example of vibration? The pendulum swinging from one end to another. That is the simplest example that we give for a pendulum. Or a tuning fork which is hit. This experiment you do in the physics lab in 8th standard. Tuning fork I hit. It starts to vibrate, it generates sound. Simple. But you don't know. So what we are supposed to do, the knowledge is already there in them, the information is already there in them. Either you have to activate it or then add some additional information to that existing theory. So that is the fundamental behind this theory called as constructivism. So what is the effect of behaviorist theory in a classroom? That is the first theory. So this is what very primitive learning happens when you go for behaviorist theory. Standard behavioral patterns. What do you expect in a standard class if you are a strict teacher? All are seriously sitting and listening to what you are saying. Okay. Whether they are listening or not, nobody knows. If I simply go near them because I have that habit, I keep roaming inside the class for the entire one hour. Okay. Except when I have to stand on the board and meet something. Because I have to do it, otherwise they will be busy doing things which are not necessary. Okay. So, the standard behavioral pattern that you expect is if you are a strict teacher, people will simply seriously sit and listen to you. You don't know whether they are listening or not, whether they are understanding or not. That's the standard behavior you may say. Use of rewards, temperate learning, if you 
uh, if somebody answers well, you pack this bag or maybe say a good word or maybe you, you, may, you will say, no, oh, you, uh, you, will, you will get some marks in your assignment, so something like that. So you are, you are using rewards to encourage them. You also punish the student. Standard behavior that you observe in the class. You are angry with the student, warning once, twice, as a reason, throw him out of the class, common okay, punishments. So we give punishments to the students. And this particular theory supports road learning. Road learning is memorization. Simply memorize the things that we teach the class. But what is the effect of constructivist theory in the class? This is a slightly higher order learning that happens. Okay? You have to provide opportunities for mental activities for the learning to be effective and has to last for long. Commonly we do it. I also did it. You are in a hurry to finish your portions. You don't give the students to think, to act, nothing. Jam packed 55 minutes to simply teach, 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 teach. No room for any thinking, understanding, nothing which is not an acceptable way of teaching. If you are going for this particular theory, you have to provide them opportunities. The simplest way how you can do it, you also do it. Only thing is, see, there are certain things which you are already doing, but only thing is now I am pointing it to. You can suddenly stop the class, give one problem, give five minutes and solve, ask them to solve. A break in the class, a break in the monotony of the class. Ask the students to solve a problem. They will discuss and do it, seriously. At least, 50 to 60 percent of the students will seriously do it. You are allowing them some time to think about that topic, the concept that you have taught them in the last 30 minutes and allow them to apply it, solve a problem. That is the simplest method of suggests suggest nothing great, you also can do it. Don't have a monotonous class running for 55 minutes. Give them a break for only 5 minutes, ask them to solve some problems or at least give them an homework assignment where they can work in groups. But you should give them tough problems, not easier problems, which they can simply go and take a textbook and copy. Such kind of problems are of no use. Give them some tough problems where solutions are not available and ask them to do some assignments. Social interaction, this is what I said. Discussion in groups. The moment you give them problems and ask them to work in groups, they will do it. They will definitely do it. But only thing you have to monitor. You cannot simply stand at this part of the classroom and expect them to do. You have to keep roaming around to see really whether they are involving themselves, trying to understand things, really working out the solution for the problems. Learning to be set in meaningful context. Encourage learners to review what they have learned before teaching them a new topic. You also do it, I also do it. When you close the class, give them a summary of what you have taught for the day. And when you go to the next class, again give them a summary of what has already been taught so that they get themselves refreshed. So they are able to recall, yes, he taught us this concept yesterday. So now from here is going to begin. So they are mentally prepared so that they can learn the new things that I am going to teach them today, in today's. Encourage learners, guide them to search for information themselves. If you give them the task, they will do it. Okay. The problem is, it is on both sides. Teachers don't have faith in the students. Students don't have faith in the teachers. But it's a common scenario we come across. The common approach that we have heard and they are useless people that don't know anything is the kind of feeling that we have. Teachers also are in the So there is a problem. So there is a lack of trust between the students and the teachers. So this mistrust has to be removed. You give them necessary assignments, you give them necessary tasks, they will do it. Give time for learners to reflect upon what they have done. This is called active learning. I will do one more session, maybe on the third or fourth day, which is called as active learning. And then we have a lab session on active learning. One of our faculty is doing extensive work in active learning. In robotics, mechanical engineers here. Any mechanical engineers? Yeah. So robotics he is having an exclusive lab which is dedicated to active learning in robotics. So maybe on the last video, on the fifth day, he will be handling two sessions in the afternoon telling you about what active learning that he does and how does he do it in the lab, teaching the students. So further proceeding to the learning theories, there is another theory which is called as social cognitive theory. So if you look here, 
there are three factors which are very important in the teaching learning process to take place. So look at these three factors. They are going to have an interplay. They will interplay between these various factors. So personal factors. What are the personal factors? Personal factors means expectations, beliefs, self-perception, goals and intentions. These are the personal factors. You have come with some expectations to this FIB. I have some expectations from you as participants. So we each have some expectations. Okay? And at least 50% we have to meet. Whatever expectations you have from this FIP, we should be able to fulfill. Similarly, whatever expectations we have from you as participants, you have to fulfill. Expectations, beliefs, self-perception, goals, and intentions. Environmental factors, you have parents, you have teachers, you have faculty, all these are part of the environmental factors. Most important and the most difficult is the behavioral factors. How do I engage with the students? Behavioral engage. Most difficult, most difficult for handling or managing a class. A student's engagement in a class is composed of three components. Three components. When I'm engaging a student in a class, I have to look into these three components. You, you all are doing it, but only thing is now I am pointing it to you, that's all. Naturally, this happens in all the classes. Only thing is now I am telling you there is a theory behind it which helps you to understand what are the types of engagements that have happens inside a class. Emotional engagement, emotional reactions, how I teach, how I speak to a student, how I react if he misbehaves in the class, Similarly, how he reacts when I scold him, emotional reactions, sense of belongingness towards the task, I give him some task, how much involved he is, how much belongingness he has, feelings of liking, dislike, interest, happiness, sadness, anxiousness, aggression, all these kinds of feelings will come. There is also a session on student counseling. We have a very senior student counselor in our college. She will be handling two sessions on student counseling. Student counseling is very important for a teacher. Okay. Though we have not understood the meaning or significance of it. We have different kinds of students. Some are sound, some are emotionally disturbed. They have so many kinds of habits. So how do we deal with these kinds of students? So student counseling plays a very important role. So that is what is emotional engagement. In which as teachers we really don't have much role to play. Till and unless you go out of the way and become a counsellor for your student, well and good, you can do it. I don't do it because I don't want to become a counsellor. I am only a teacher. Okay. To the extent possible I may address his grievances to my level, but beyond that I will not do it. He has to go to a counsellor to get necessary counselling. Okay. So my involvement here is very limited. My involvement probably will be more in these two. One is cognitive engagement, which I already told you, and then behavioral engagement. Make the student active in the class. Now I have to make all of you active in the class. I should not allow you to sleep. I should not allow you to look at the mobiles. How do I do it? Uh, of course, I have my own limitations. Okay. Maybe I can modulate my voice. I can emphasize a certain point with a louder voice or a louder pitch, bring down my voice. So I can adopt my own methodology for emphasizing a certain point. So if there is a positive engagement, what do you expect from the class? Willingness of the students to participate in class activities, responding to teachers' queries, class attendance is regular, they make a lot of efforts in preparing their assignments, submitting their projects, they do their homework properly, no disruptive behavior, no disruptive behavior in the class. They are all properly sitting inside the class, not disturbing the teacher. You can also have negative behavior, which I will see a little later. Lot of negative behaviors are possible from the students, as also from the teachers. There is no one best learning style or one best teaching style, as I already told you. Now, whether it is teaching or learning, in learning there are two basic methods of learning. By, uh, any, by any chance, can you name them? Two common types of learning happens in students, whether it is a school student or whether it is an engineering student. I am asking you because I know. Okay. Uh, 
Sequential learners are learners who learn in sequence. First I have to tell them the fundamentals. Then I have to tell them the theory. Then I have to do the derivation. Then I have to solve a problem. Then I have to tell them the application. That is sequential learning, which is a common method we do, correct? Suppose I want to teach vibrations, what will I do? I will first go and say, what is vibration? I will write a definition. What are the different types of vibrations? And then what is the governing theory of vibration? I will do a derivation. Then I will solve a lot of problem. Then the finally I will say, what are the applications of vibrations? I will start giving examples. That is sequential learning. Global learning, I start with applications first. And then I go down to the theory of fundamentals, that is global learning. Some students prefer you to start with applications and then go to the theory. Some people prefer you to start with theory and then go to the applications. <coughs> so virtually what is learning? This has to be by very clearly understood. There should be a qualitative change in the relation between the learner and that which is learned. If that happens, then only learning is taking place. Now at the end of this, I will stop in another five minutes. If some perceptible change has happened within you after this one hour session, that means some learning has taken place. If nothing has changed and you are same as what we are at 9.30, no learning has happened. Okay? So there should be a qualitative change in the relation between the learner and that which is learned. If this is happening, then only learning is going to take place. Now, that is from the learning perspective. Now, I am a teacher, now I have to teach. What teaching styles I can adopt for answering those learning styles? We have seen the learning styles, now we let us look at the teaching styles. What type of information is emphasized by the instructor? Concrete, factual, or abstract? So, what type of information are we providing to the students? Concrete means applications. That is very concrete. I give you examples, you will think, you will understand what you are doing. I am talking about vibrations. If you give me some example, you will not understand. And you will say, hold a simple pendulum and then oscillate it, then you will visualize, yeah, this is how that's a relative motion happening from this end to that end. Okay. So I start with applications, he is able to understand better concrete. Some people are very good at understanding abstract concepts. They are good in understanding abstract concepts. Theory of relativity, even today people don't understand it. Very difficult. Why? Right? Because it's a very abstract concept which requires much deeper reading and understanding. Okay. In fact, I am reading a book on theory of relativity now, but I am not able to understand anything out of it because the concepts are very abstract. So there are some students who are good in understanding abstract concepts, but there are certain students who are good in understanding concrete concepts. What mode of presentation is best? Some students like visual representations, diagrams, graphs, figures, videos, all those things they like. They understand better, they are able to understand better. Okay. Whereas some people, they like to listen, okay. lectures. They like to listen, they like to read, they like to write, they like to understand. How is the presentation organized? Are they have told you inductively or deductively? So, one is from theory to applications, another is from applications to theory. What mode of student participation is facilitated by the presentation? Active learning means students should talk, okay, but we think it is a nuisance. It is a nuisance, of course. It's a nuisance. It should be controlled, otherwise people will start making a lot of noise. They should discuss things. This particularly happens, I also teach a course on operations research. Operations research, you know, problems are very lengthy, and I give the problem. And then they start solving, they make a lot of noise. Sometimes, initially I used to get very agitated, but now I started ignoring it because they do it genuinely. You think they are degrading a nuisance inside the class, but they genuinely sit and discuss. Okay. So that is active learning. All students, some students, if you observe, they are only doing things on their own. They don't want anybody to be part of their group. They are not people working in group. I am such kind of a person. I am a loner. I don't get easily with groups. Okay. I, I, I am on my own. I don't mingle with people so easily. So you have both kinds of students. Students who are very friendly, who want to work in groups. Students who don't want to work in groups, they want to work individually. So that kind of students. What type of perspective is provided on the information presented? Is it, as I said, is it sequential or is it global? So 
with this this particular dimensions of learning and teaching style has been developed by Richard M. Felter. So, all teaching and learning that happens in this world, whether it is in engineering, whether it is in any other discipline, will be covered by these styles. Everything has been covered. Over the years, a lot of psychologists have contributed. So, sensory, intuitive, visual, auditory, inductive, deductive, active, reflective, sequential, global. They are teaching style, concrete, abstract, visual, verbal, inductive, deductive, active, passive, sequential, and global teaching. So, you can have different kinds of learners. Yes, there are some more points which have been added here. Kinesthetic, which is not very widely used, at least for engineers. What is kinesthetic works in medical sciences. What does it involve? Taste, touch and smell. You are physically touching something. Maybe in the lab, to a very limited extent it may happen. But taste and touch, definitely we are not going to taste anything in any lab. The taste is rolled out. Okay. So taste, touch and smell, it is kinesthetic. Okay. Other than visual auditory, we also have kinesthetic. Let's look at this observation which is very interesting. Students retain 10% of what they read, 26% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, 70% of what they say, and 90% of what they say as they do something. And let me quickly end this session. Can you tell me which particular component of our entire engineering curriculum matches the last one? Before I stop. Project. Project work is the component which answers the last component. 90% of what they say as they do something, they are more comfortable only when they do and say. If you simply ask them to say, maybe in a seminar they will simply read by heart and say something. But in a project work, only people who are seriously involved, that is also there, in a group of four, only two are working, another two are not working. People who are seriously involved, they will answer your questions 100% because they have themselves involved in the project work. They know everything about the project. So there are they don't have any doubts when they are going to answer your questions. So we will stop here for the session.